Welcome back to the lab. Today we're going to talk about some things that are involved when designing the system for safety. We're going to use some of the features that we designed into our UPS project as an example to guide our discussion. This will help us to boil down the theory around designing something for safety into practical physical examples. And before we dive straight in, I want to take a moment to give you some context. Designing for safety does not have one method. There's no universally correct way to ensure that every system will be safe. And safety is usually not the only priority when designing a system, though it is a very big one. Typically, besides safety, a designer will be asked to ensure that a circuit will be designed such that the board is not damaged in particular fault conditions. This is done more as a convenience thing than anything else because no company wants to be dealing with field returns due to misuse of their product. Therefore, reasonable misuse or abuse is usually considered when designing a system. The features that protect a system or design against reasonable misuse sometimes make designing for safety easier, and sometimes these are conflicting design goals. The guiding principles that surround designing for safety are not terribly complicated. It's the application of these simple principles where things can get a bit messy. Let's list out some of the core principles at play. Fault detection is a mechanism by which a circuit or system can detect that a fault has occurred. Implementing fault detection has no impact on the performance of the system, during the fault condition that is, but merely means that we can detect the fault. Fault tolerance, on the other hand, means that the circuit or system will continue to operate normally while that fault is present. Typically, this means that there's no degradation in critical performance as defined for that particular system. Double fault tolerance just extends this principle one step further, and this means that the circuit or system must continue to operate normally after a second fault is introduced in the system. When evaluating fault conditions, random faults are typically what's considered. This means that if a very detailed analysis is demanded, a component fault anywhere in the circuit may need to be considered, even if it's not particularly likely. One of the easiest ways to build safety into a system is by implementing successful software handshaking. Having two processors, both measure the same physical thing on a board, calculate some result independently, and then share that result with another processor, that did the same calculation and measurement, that can provide a lot of fault tolerance just by nature. If either processor disagrees about what was measured or the conclusion that was made because of the measurement, that means that either the measurement process failed on one end or the other, the computational ability of one processor or the other has been compromised, or there has been a random failure inside of the part or connected to the part. Despite the severity of the situation making an invalid conclusion, if we're evaluating a single fault condition, we can rely on the second processor to detect the error and shut everything down safely. Performing a periodic sanity check is what I would consider to be software handshaking or software redundancy. It doesn't really need to add much work to the software either, since if you think about this when you're developing it, you can write that sort of logic in a modular way so that you can put it onto another microcontroller easily. This method of software handshaking can ultimately provide a lot of protection when implemented well, not to mention, the digital communication between processors can be used to check anything going on in the micro, not just physical stuff. These checks can get really granular right down to the register configurations, and that's great. This type of real-time diagnostic check, the like register level check, is very difficult to run successfully without a coprocessor. I mean, if you don't trust that your processor is running correctly, how can you trust it to check itself, right? We implemented this feature in our UPS by adding a communication link between the two microcontrollers on our board. This allows them to communicate and ultimately sanity check one another. The known input that we're testing for our check is measuring the voltage supplied to the board, which is compared to each circuit's separate analog shunt reference. Both micros can measure the supply voltage with respect to their local reference, which should be five volts, and then compare notes. We may expand this feature to pass more data between processors to communicate both state and status, but these additions have more to do with feature addition than safety. Implementing this extra communication would allow us to drop another microcontroller onto those serial buses and then gain information about the state of the whole system. So we could glean off things like whether we're on battery or main power, if desired. If our system is already designed to have two processors that monitor the state of everything,
This makes it relatively easy to implement shared responsibility as well, which is the next piece of fault tolerance. Shared responsibility can take many, many forms, but in general, this means that both processors need to agree that it's safe and the right time to do something before it happens. In the case of our UPS, we implemented shared responsibility in a couple of ways. In order for the inverter output to turn on, the main processor must first turn on the hot swap controller. Once this is turned on, then the second processor is able to turn on the boost converter, which goes from the low voltage to high voltage, and the inverter output stage, which ultimately generates the sine wave. Therefore, in order for the sine wave to appear, both processors need to be actively enabling something in order for power to get out of the system. Both processors have temperature monitoring of at least one subsystem that's under control by the other processor, and this means that both processors can detect thermal runaway of subsystems controlled by its partner. Since the thermal overload is definitely not a part of our design, this would be a key indicator that something has gone sideways and then the surviving processor has the information required to discern that we need to shut down. If, for whatever reason, we implemented software handshaking without implementing shared responsibility, that wouldn't be very effective. Sure, our coprocessor could still detect that something had gone wrong, but then we wouldn't be able to do anything to fix the situation. By implementing both software handshaking and shared responsibility in our UPS, we are now capable of detecting a fault and then forcing the system to resolve into a safe state. If we have any reason to believe that we've lost control of the UPS output, shut it down. This ability is symmetrical, such that if either processor were misbehaving or behaving erratically, there'd be no consequence to connected equipment or safety. In our UPS, we implemented fault detection through temperature monitoring, presence detection for critical voltages, and a periodic sanity status check over the digital communication interface. Nothing too crazy, but certainly a good starting point. Now, we gave each processor authority to disable whatever feature was found to be critical. Criticality can be defined as a function of danger level and risk to damaging the board itself. Probability of occurrence is also very important. In the case of our UPS, our implementation of shared responsibility requires that one processor controls enabling the low voltage bus and the other controls the step up from low to high voltage. Therefore, both processors can make the decision to turn off the inverter output if it finds a reason to. Moving away from software land for a minute, let's come back to somewhere where things are constrained by physics, logic, and reason. A great way to implement fault tolerance is hardware redundancy, or simply, put down two copies of a circuit. This is very similar to software handshaking in the sense that the same process is done twice and the output is compared when, you know, after it's done twice. Two instances of the same circuit are used and either the AND or OR of these two circuits is used to control the critical function. An AND is used for enable signals and an OR is used for disable signals. Hardware redundancy may take many forms, but in general, this is a very straightforward way to implement single fault tolerance that's pretty bulletproof, even if it's not the cheapest. I say it's the simplest way because by nature, two copies of any circuit provide at least single fault tolerance. At worst, if a single fault causes one entire circuit to fail, we have an entirely independent second copy that's still functioning, and that means that nothing bad can happen. Forcing two decision makers to agree means that if one circuit has a valid state, the other state doesn't matter. At very least, two catastrophic faults would be necessary to corrupt the output of a duplicated circuit, one for each circuit that would make both be corrupt. Thankfully, the probability of two identical failures of the same component at the same time in two copies of a properly designed circuit is incredibly unlikely, and that's usually not a situation we need to consider. The guiding principle of single fault tolerance is this. If the worst possible single failure in the system were to occur in this system, would it put someone in harm's way? Would it put anyone at risk? If the answer across the board is no, then the system is probably single fault tolerant from a safety perspective. For a formal evaluation of risk and fault tolerance, a FEMA, or Failure Modes and Effects Analysis, is one tool that could be used. We didn't follow any sort of formal process for this UPS design, but let us know in the comments if you'd like to see what performing a FEMA looks like. You might see that in a future video if we see enough in the comments. Fault detection is very different than fault tolerance. In fact, it's a whole nother ballgame.
Fault detection is simply the ability for a system to detect a fault. It doesn't mean that the system can fix the problem or continue to operate, but it does mean that the system needs to know what's going on. I can think of a great example of this uh, in our UPS. This is all surrounding the 10 volt rail. This 10 volt rail is used to drive our fans, but if this rail goes down, it's also the source for our analog voltage references. Therefore, if we've ever detected that fan power has failed, we know that all decisions driven by analog voltage measurements in either processor are invalid. And that's huge for us, since our entire system is driven by analog decisions. It's got a control loop in both processors. One manages battery charging, and the other manages the inverter output using that reference. A failure of the 10 volt rail means that the battery charger and inverter performance, are, they're both indeterminate. And that's a huge issue that could potentially apply 250 volts DC across whatever's connected to the UPS. There's nothing we can really do to fix the fact that the 10 volt rail isn't present, and therefore there's nothing we can do to continue operating normally. However, the fact that we can detect this fault means that we're able to shut down into a safe state before anything goes wrong. If the 10 volt power fail flag ever asserts or the known VCC measurement is not correct, we'll know immediately that we need to power down and we need to power down fast. I'm sorry if the difference between fault detection and fault tolerance is painfully obvious to you, but this difference is a subtle point that's often missed, confused, or misused. The last point on fault tolerance I want to hit is a small twist, and that's bringing in the concept of multi-fault or double-fault tolerance. Take single-fault tolerance, where we must be able to operate normally despite a fault, and I'll multiply that idea by two or three or four. This means that we need to support two or three or four cascaded faults and continue to operate normally. This is where things can really start to get out of hand. Two-fault or double-fault tolerance, if done in the most conservative way, may require three independent copies of a circuit, and three independent microcontrollers to cross-check one another is pretty extreme if you ask me. So typically, this isn't done just for cost reasons. So the circuits are designed to be single-fault tolerant by nature, and then two instances of that circuit are used. In fact, I've only seen this described as necessary in two applications, because it's so extreme, controlling valves that affect the flow of explosive gases and some parts of class 3 medical devices. In other words, we don't need to worry about true double fault tolerance about 97% of the time. Designing in or evaluating fault tolerance can be difficult to navigate. It's easy to get lost in what ifs and design something in circles. The way that we hardened a lot of the circuits in our UPS against faults is actually pretty simple. We designed every part of the circuit to be disabled by default. We designed the inverter controls to be disabled by default, the boost converter to be disabled by default, the hot swap controller to be disabled by default. Every piece of the chain is disabled by default. Requiring active intervention by both processors to do something is a great first step in fault tolerance. It isn't enough to ensure fault tolerance by any means but it is generally good design practice and could save you some headaches. Disabling everything by default will especially save you a lot of headaches if a mistake was made causing one link in the chain to be enabled by default, because every other piece of the chain will prevent it from turning on. Our final point for today is critical for applying everything that we've talked about so far. Hazard time. How quickly does a circuit need to respond before a detected fault becomes hazardous? For some systems, we might need to react in minutes or seconds, and that's no problem. For other systems, we might need to react within fractions of a millisecond before a hazard occurs. Evaluating hazard time for your system is really important because this may drive key decisions about how faults must be detected and mitigated. If your system requires a message to get sent across a shared communication bus to mitigate a hazard, one needs to prove that that message will get across that bus fast enough without fail. When you have seconds to work with, easy. If you have 10 microseconds, a periodic ping that ensures communication is still active might cause the whole communication bus to be flooded with those pings, crippling the normal performance of the system. In our case, the primary hazard is electrocuting a user, but this risk is no worse than if a user were plugging something into a regular outlet supplied by the power company. Because of that, we mitigated all of our safety risks by using industry standard connectors and wiring practices 
putting everything that was a larger risk than that inside of a giant grounded metal box. <laughs> in other words, the fault tolerance is built into our system by design, and therefore our software doesn't really need to worry about managing safety critical faults. The redundancies that we built into the UPS are there to manage risk of damaging the UPS itself and not to really improve the safety of the device because, well, there's no risk to the user beyond typical household mains. And generally, the fault tolerance that we've built in will improve the reliability of our device. The concept of fault detection and fault tolerance, hazard time, and mitigating faults is easy to get lost in. However, in the case of our UPS, I feel like we've adequately protected the system while keeping the safety functions on our boards pretty reasonable. We ultimately boiled down our implemented features to good design practice, a couple independent voltage references, temperature monitoring, and periodic communication between our processors. These features aren't strictly required as a design function for safety, but they will be critical in ensuring that everything is going smoothly within our UPS, potentially extending its life. We're well on our way through the design phase for our inverter, so subscribe to be notified of our future videos, where we'll talk about how to implement a PID controller and design a DC to DC isolated push-pull converter. I think that fault tolerance and safety are great, and if you think so too, let me know by hitting the like button on this video or leaving a comment letting us know what you enjoyed. Most of all, I hope that you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon. Thanks for watching EE for everyone, and thank you staying till the end. Bye!